Thank you for the work of the cross, which is, which is such a completed work that we have access to a place of intimacy. We need you. We're hungry for you. Would you speak to our hearts this morning? Open the eyes and ears of our heart. Because, Lord, I'm, I'm believing for an encounter with the Father today. <clears throat> And we thank you in advance, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> I want to start just with <clears throat> kind of a profound reminder, which he showed me a little while ago, but, sh- but it, it's, it grips my heart when I consider it. <clears throat> and I've mentioned it here before, but I, I need to be reminded myself. And, and what it, the truth is that we're fully known and yet fully loved. It's incredible truth. He knows every single thought we've ever had. He knows every motivation behind what we've done. He knows everything we've done or even indeed not done. He knows every failure. He knows when we've been hot or cold. He knows when we've been full of faith and full of doubt. He knows all of our past. Nothing is hidden. And in the natural, we would believe, well, if someone knew that, then that would just bring rejection. We'd probably hide, walk in shame, perform, self-protection mode, maybe even reject ourselves. Some of us used to believe we were disqualified from being loved. But here's the amazing truth. And I, I don't know about you, but I have to keep being reminded of this. The amazing, amazing truth We're fully loved. In spite of that, fully loved. He is love. He's the God of compassion, the God of all comfort. He sees us as sons and daughters. His love is based on relationship, not on our performance. God does not love us if we change. He loves us so that we can indeed be changed. I need to be reminded of that every day. And I think it's the longing of every human heart for one person who really knows every single thing about us, yet completely loves and accepts us. And the good news is, that's God himself. One of the things he was, when I was preparing for this, he, he wanted me to remind each of us that... Uh, Jesus is the way to the Father. But Jesus is not the Father. There's distinct persons in the Trinity. One is Jesus and one is the Father. And Jesus, of course, is the only way to the Father. But the Father is a distinct person. And one of the uh, people I really honor and respect is uh, Derek Prince. And this is what he said. He says, you can be born again, have the assurance that you're going to heaven... And you could be spirit-filled to have an effective ministry, walking in the gifts, ministering under the anointing, successful in the eyes of the world, yet be played with being a child who has a heart of one who feels like he's fatherless. How tragic that one of the greatest men of the last century who helped thousands to come to the knowledge of the truth of God's word, prayed for thousands to be healed, brought thousands to freedom from demonic bondage, one thousand to the Lord woke up every morning until he was 80 years old and felt he didn't have a personal position in the Father's home or in the Father's heart. He was theologically correct in his doctrine about his scriptural position. And I think there's many of us in the church have been like that. But he had not yet experienced intimacy with the Father. It's not just the kingdom of his beloved, God's beloved son, Jesus. It's the kingdom of all of us. If we don't experience the entering in that place of relationship with the Father in the kingdom, then we miss one of the greatest blessings of sonship that we can experience personally. The more of being close to the Father and his loving acceptance of us. So we need a relationship with the Son and with the Father. 
And for my, my case, I spent 20 years loving Jesus, being born again, got filled with the Holy Spirit. But I was still an orphan. Down by the grace, I ran into Jack Winter, the airport church, and he taught us that it's about coming into relationship with the Father and coming into sonship. God is desperate to meet us and pour out his love for us. He goes to any length to restore relationship with us. The ultimate expression of his love is giving of his son Jesus that we just celebrated in communion. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And we love because he first loved us. He actually gives us a capacity to love. And he wants us to experience that love. It's not just to know about his love, but actually encounter his love. Ephesians 3.17 says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, long, and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love, this is, this is an inner experience of knowing that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Romans 5 says, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit that carries it to our hearts. He goes on to say that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. It's an amazing demonstration of his love. But what I want to talk this morning about is something which has caused blockage to many of us. And the blockage really is, is often through the lens of our own experience through being fathered by our dads. I know in my case, I, I loved Jesus, but I actually didn't have any interest in knowing the Father because he was kind of a scary guy. I saw him as a holy, righteous judge. And depending what kind of father you had, then it may color your picture of who the Father is. And as I travel around the world these days, I realize we're, we're part of a fatherless generation. Every nation, it's true. And the tragedy is, is so much of the church is also fatherless. I know when I was in uh, South Africa, and Heidi had asked me to come and teach at the Harvest School. And there's all these amazing, hungry, passionate lovers of God. But what disturbed me is, is so many of them, a very high percentage of them, were actually fatherless. They wanted to serve God. They wanted to lay their lives down for Jesus. But they didn't know who they were as sons and daughters. So I spent two weeks getting poured out. And so many had an amazing encounter. If you don't find this love, there's a good chance in ministry you may burn out. Because how do you know if you've done enough to earn this kind of love? So we want to look at different father types this morning. Because depending who your father was, it probably gives you a, a distortion of who God the Father was. One of the types is an absent father. And uh, this type of father is not present in your life, maybe perhaps because of health. Maybe he died young. Maybe there's a divorce. Maybe he's addicted to work and he just spent all of his time at work. Maybe he traveled a lot. Maybe he was, he was, uh, he just wasn't available. And of course, this can result in feelings of neglect, rejection, and abandonment in terms of relationship with God. And then you may put this on God the Father. You may think he's distant, uninvolved. You might only feel his love intermittently. You may, have to, you may feel that you have to make your own way in the world. That God won't come through for you. There may be a sense of guilt and striving for love and approval. There may be a fear of getting close to God as he may abandon you just like you feel abandoned by your own father. 
That's the absent father. Another one is, the, is a passive father. This type of father is not responsive, involved, or active. It's difficult to get his attention. He's often hidden behind a book, newspaper, or engrossed in TV. Maybe he's addicted to, to sports. When our family was a, a major sports, we were sports fans, and we, our whole life was given to sports, I think. He's unemotional, withdrawn, rarely is able to enjoy joy or grief. This does not necessarily mean the father didn't feel anything towards you, but maybe he didn't, he found it so hard to express it. <clears throat> now this is my father, he, he, was, he was a Brit born in 1900, and uh, he really believed that emotion was, uh, had no value, and we're British, we have no emotion. <laughs> That's not a good way to come into a marriage, I suppose, is it? And uh, he found great difficulty in expressing affection. And I believe it's because he never received it from his father. But uh, I remember once I sat in his lap, but he quickly put me down and picked up his newspaper because he, he didn't quite know how to handle that. And here's this little boy who was desperate for his father's affection. But my dad couldn't really do that. He wasn't able to, to share joy or grief. He was very secretive. He never shared any stories of what his growing up. And uh, it doesn't do anything for your kids if you don't let them know who you are. In fact, I started off that way myself. My kids had to tell me, well, Dad, you're like that. <laughs> and of course I had judged my dad being a good Christian I judged him <laughs> and I became him but I didn't stay there by, his, by God's grace but if he finds it hard to express then you, you put this on to God it's hard to feel close to him which was my perception of who the father was it could be a hidden anger because you weren't giving the love you needed you find difficulty in getting in touch with emotions. There's an inability to express intimacy in relationships. So pray for Janice. That's the way I started in a marriage. Because I was like my dad. Intimacy with God seems blocked. It's difficult to sense his presence. You know what I love about this, though? Is what we've come into is uh, he changes everything everything <laughs> by his grace I'm so thankful for Jack Winter who taught us that it's uh, church is not a system of religious obligations which I thought it was but it's coming into this intimate connectedness with father himself yeah. your own personal encountering of his love and he really wants to restore what the locust has eaten do you know that and we'll do some business at the end of this little talk this morning. <clears throat> and it's kind of interesting now is because I just, <clears throat> every day I live for his presence. My wife, she's one of these people that doesn't believe in mornings. <laughs> so uh, it works for us because we have a tiny apartment, but she, she doesn't like to get up too early. But I'm, a, I'm an early riser. So uh, I have my own little place in, in the living room. And I make this huge thing of coffee. Anybody here like coffee? Praise God. And we don't want healing, do we? No. <laughs> and I get some worship music. There was some amazing worship out these days. And that's the, the door into the, his presence. I bring out the word of God. And I, I come with an expectation to meet with God. Like I'm, I'm looking for and expecting an encounter. Sometimes it takes half an hour. But there's something about you have to. Thank you very much. <laughs> because I have to have this, sometimes I have to press through this. It says, I, I know you want to come. I'm not bringing my shopping list. I'm seeking your face. And I want you. Like he can't resist that. Do you know that? He can't resist it. Yeah. 
So even this morning, I was up, I actually slept into 7 today. I was, usually I'm up at 6 or 5.30, but today was 7. But <clears throat> I just say, Father, I, I, I so need you this morning. Would you come? Because I know he's, it's almost like he can't resist you. But if you have hunger for him, he can't resist you. <clears throat> I think that's why Heidi is so uh, fruitful, because he wouldn't dare not show up. <laughs> Because she's just thrown herself on God and completely depended on him and showing up. And it's wonderful. And of course, you may, you may talking about the passive father, you may, you may think you have to strive to gain his attention. Do I have to perform for God for him to show up? You don't have to perform. You see, we, it's because we've had a wrong perception of who the Father is. Another type of Father is a performance-oriented Father. This Father has high standards, untempered by enough love, nurture, or affection. He points to faults and failures. That was also my perception of the Father. If I come to him, he's just going to show, oh, we in, you messed up again. He didn't do this, he didn't do that, he didn't memorize scripture this week. He didn't read enough, he didn't pray enough, he didn't tithe enough, he didn't save enough. <sighs> this kind of father thinks he needs to motivate you to succeed. But your, your strengths and successes are rarely affirmed. Love and affirmation expressed only when you perform well. You know, the, I told you that I judged my father. Now we are, our first born is, born is also a David, and he was brilliant, but he would bring report cards with eight subjects, and he'd have one B and seven A's. Guess what I focused in on? How'd you get a B? You're, you're going to have to do much better to, to get an A next time. Yeah. Thanks, Dad. In religious households, which our household was in the beginning, truth is valued above love. You feel like you can never do anything right. Of course, the minimum is perfection, right? This leads to fear of failure, feeling that you have, you have to earn the Father's love. You can never live up to the Father's standards. You may never feel good enough in Father's eyes. When I first started hearing about God the Father through Jack Winter, and the father would, would say to me, he said, Ian, if you do it all wrong, I still love you. Whoa, are you serious? Because I was so much into performance. Of course, you're not going to do it all wrong. And how in the world are you ever going to risk for God if you're afraid of making a mistake? <laughs> right? And we didn't know what he was going to call us to do, but... Um, Somehow he, he knows what he's doing. There's little sense of rest in this kind of fathering. Sometimes you feel you have to wear a mask and pretend you're something until you're not. There's a chance of burnout, despondency, depression may come. And you turn to performance. So you really believe that love is conditional on how well you perform. So if you don't get an A+, plus, then he won't love you. That's the performance-oriented father. And some of us in this room have that. Have that. Authoritarian father. This father is a strict legalist who lives by the rules, but has little ability to give intimacy and express love. Obedience is valued above relationship and truth above love. Approval comes only by obeying the written and unwritten rules. Internally, this translates into the belief that God, sorry, that love and obedience are intertwined. And often it leads to a crushed or heavy heart. So, how in the world do you conceive of a relationship with God who's authoritarian? We probably see him as harsh and angry. 
It probably leads to fear. You know, I really loved Jesus from the beginning, way back in 1971. But my picture of Jesus on the cross was actually keeping an angry God away from me. <laughs> because he's just, he's got this bony, do you know he had a bony finger in my eyes? And he's, Ian, you've messed up again. You've done it again. You've dubbed me down. But he's nothing like that. And I thought God was only one interested in the rules because we seem to be just studying the rules all the time. There was no talk of relationship. So once I know we, we sing often that it's Jesus only, but in another sense, it's not because it's Jesus and the Father. Anybody here love Jesus? Four of you? Oh, good, there's a lot more, that's good. I think one of the greatest transformations, well, two, is the first is coming to Jesus. That, that's always first. It's always first. But we have to have that second relationship as well as with the Father. Because I, my life has been dramatically changed after 20 years of being a Christian. And you know, for uh, Derek Prince, he was 80 years of age. After 50 years of ministry, he even had a three-part sermon, sermon, knowing God as Father. And then he met the Father. <laughs> so he had, a, he had a scriptural reason of why we have a relationship with the Father, but he never met the Father. But when he met the Father, his whole life changed. At 80 years of age. I used to think that was old. Now I'm not so thinking it's old. <laughs> I don't know what, what that's all about. <clears throat> The most tragic one, I think, is an abusive father. You know, God has placed us in families. We're meant to have a father who protects us, cares for us, nurtures us. A safe place. And it's, it's, it's like the, the enemy of our souls uses the very one who's meant to protect us somehow to, be, to abuse us. It's so cruel. This kind of father always seems to be angry. He inflicts physical, emotion, verbal, maybe sexual abuse on family members. Tremendous inner pain, fear, insecurity in relationships. You wonder if he's in a good mood today. Is it safe? Is he angry today? You may believe it's your own fault. Imagine if you think of the fathers like this, God the Father. You're aware of the emotional atmosphere he carries around him. You may feel guilt, shame, and sense of worthlessness. If you don't have the security of a father, that, that, there's a huge void in your life. You may shut down, you may turn to counterfeit affections for love to dull the pain. You feel unsure of your relationships or well, getting near to God means you're going to be punished. You're afraid of God. Because he is, is he in a good mood today? So there's a huge gulf between you and the Father, which you've actually, it's out of your belief system. You may also feel angry at God, but why didn't he protect you from your Father? Of course, you have great trouble respecting authority because you feel there's always an agenda. Now, the, the good father. Some of you may have had a really good father. This type of father unconditionally pours out his affirmation, love, encouragement in concrete ways, even in the midst of discipline. He's proud of you, initiates Relationships, affirmation spoken, given in hugs, kisses, touch, reassurance, and encouragement. I find as, as, as he has me flowing in the love of the Father, I'm, all, I'm actually doing this without even realizing it because I'm always looking for the next person to hug. Or I sense that you know, the Father's proud of you right now. Not when you become what you think you should be, but he's proud of you now. Even in discipline, there's love. 
a God, good father speaks openly how much they love you, about your value, identity, and purpose. He promotes you and is openly proud of you. He initiates, comes to the rescue when you need them. So when you mess up, boom, he's right there. <laughs> I need to know that even now, because sometimes I mess up. But I take one step towards home, and I always run into an embrace. It's not the accusing figure, oh, you, this is the 27th time you've done that. <laughs> He's got an embrace. He always encourages. He believes. I read in the Bible, I was reading through my Bible the other day, and I, I wrote, I think about eight years ago, because he it spoke to my heart. He says, Ian, I believe in you. And it's interesting. I, I needed to re, be reminded of that. He says, he believes in us. He sees you, loves you for who you are, not who you are not. A good friend of us, ours, who happens to be here this morning, and I think her name is Ruth Fazell. Uh. Welcome home, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> She's a dear friend. But she spoke to something to Janice and I, because we, we, we both have kids that are maybe not in the best place we would like to be with, with the Lord. And she said, I celebrate who they are, not who they're not. So you call forth the good things in them. And we've taken that to heart. And, and, it's, and it's like if you're always speaking these good things over their life, then they'll listen to who you are and what you bring. Thank you, Ruth. And remember how Jesus was with the, sorry, the Father was with Jesus at his baptism. He says, you're, this, you're my son whom I love with you, whom I'm well pleased. That's an unconditional love. It's not based on ministry. It's based on sonship. It's based on the connectedness to the Father. And having a good father means you have more confidence, a greater ability to risk and rebound after disappointment or rejection. I could not do what I've been called to do now if I didn't know the Father. Back in 1998, when he, uh, the Father said, you know, right at the height of the revival, when the Father says, um, and I loved every moment, I was involved in everything, I just loved it. Oh, I just finished saying, I'm never ever going to leave this place. And then the Father says, would you leave this place? <laughs> Because he says, I've made you for something. I want you to carry the revelation of the Father to the nations. But we couldn't do it unless this was his calling, unless his anointing was on it, unless he knew that this would bring us life as well as bring life to many others. So it gave his confidence, ability to risk some of us have very good fathers, but there's only one perfect father. And that's God the Father. Good fathers paved the way for to be, live healthier, balanced, and wholesome lives in God. A place of peace and rest and joy. Now, I think the Father wants to do a little business this morning. Because the fact is, none of us in this room have a perfect father. So there's areas of uh, brokenness, areas of lack, insufficiency of love and affection. But he's a perfect father. And whatever you missed, he will restore. For me, I think it was even back to conception because my mother desperately wanted a girl. But he said to me, but I wanted, I wanted a boy. Wow. And all the way along through childhood, through adolescence, even as a, an adult, where there's huge places of emptiness, where I was dead emotionally, had no confidence, 
Didn't even like who I was. I heard that. <laughs> but it restores everything. Everything. I think it's almost like we're back in the garden and there had never been a fall. And you come to be the person you always were intended to be. Without twisted thinking, ungodly beliefs, you come to, to have this wonderful connectedness, walking with the Father in the cool of the garden. And you live out of this relationship. It's for all of us. Do you know? It's for all of us. So why don't we stand? And I encourage you to take part. Because as I said before, this has been the most tremendous transformation in my life other than coming to Jesus. is coming to the Father. Remember that Jesus is wonderful, but he's not the Father. He expresses the Father. He takes us to the Father. I want to introduce you to the God the Father because we need that connectedness with him. So we have to put away the past so we can move on. So let's pray together. Let's pray, pray out loud so I think it's good to, for ourselves to hear ourselves speak it out. <clears throat> we want to we let go of our dads. We want to we put, it, put it behind us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for my dad. Thank you for the ways he was able to be a good father. Thank you that I'm his child. Picture your father in front of you now. But, but dad, you were not perfect. I realize a lot of it is because you were never fathered. You didn't receive what you needed. And you, you couldn't give me what you had not first received. Father, I needed your embrace. I needed your time. I needed your attention. I needed your affection. I wanted you to believe in me. I wanted you to know me. I wanted to be my own person. I wanted to pursue what I wanted to pursue. I'm not a carbon copy of you. I needed your encouragement. I wanted you to believe in me. I just wanted you to hold me. I wanted you to look at me with loving eyes. I wanted to be accepted. This morning I choose grace. Dad, I want to set you free. I want to tear up the list of IOUs I've held against you. I want to tear it up. Leave it at the foot of the cross. I give up the right to ever go back to that list. I set you free. I even declare you don't owe me anything. Now, Father, would you show me how I reacted to my father? 
The word of God says we are to honor our fathers and mothers. And there's ways I dishonored my father. And that's my sin. And I take ownership of my sin. Father, have mercy upon me. Forgive me for my judgments. Would you put the cross of Jesus between myself and my judgments? And where I have been reaping what I have sown, because of those judgments, may the reaping now go to the cross and no longer go to me. I am my father's child. That's who I am. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Whoa. Now, Heavenly Father, as I, as I lift my hands to you this morning, will you bring healing to any wounds I've received in my life? From my lack of being fathered, I invite you to be a father to me. Right back to conception, will you restore me? Love me. Fill in the empty places. Bring comfort. Thank you that I'm chosen of God. Thank you that before you made the heavens and the earth, the Bible says you knew me. You've carried me in your heart for thousands of years. I'm exactly what you wanted. That's who I am. So restore me, Father. Healing. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. I want to take advantage of what Jesus has already done. I want to come into my place of intimacy with the Father. Thank you that there's a place in the Father's heart with my name on it. <clears throat> I belong to you. And you belong to me. Wow. So Father, take me on my own journey of restoration, transformation, by revelation. Wow. Whoa. Some of you are going to be radically transformed like me. <laughs> it's incredible. I don't know why the whole church doesn't want this because it's so radically changing. So we're going to have this time at the front here and we could have some of the leaders come forward, small group leaders, prophetic team, if you would like a touch from the Father this morning, we would like to be the instruments or the conduit so he can do it. You can receive an impartation through other people. So that's another way of receiving the love of the Father. So if you would like a touch this morning, you can use any one of us here, and he wants to touch your life today. Amen.